an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Or indeed on our panel, the Conservative Cabinet Office Minister and former Chief of Staff to George Osborne, Matthew Hancock, Ken Livingstone, once Mayor of London, now back on Labour's front line overseeing the party's defence review, including Trident. Kate Andrews, of the think tank originally founded to support Margaret Thatcher, the Adam Smith Institute. The comedian who worked for Labour under Tony Blair and tore up his party card when Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader, Matt Ford. And Pete Wishart, SNP MP since 2001, one of only two MPs to have appeared on top of the pops. And the, the usual prize for anyone who can name the other. Welcome to our panel. <laughs> David Morris, MP, Conservative backbencher, if you didn't know. Uh, if you want to text or tweet during the programme, hashtag BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. Text comments to 83981 and push that red button if you want to see what other people are saying. Our first question from Monique Sidhu, please. Um, will bombing ISIS really make us any safer? Ken Livingstone. Well, the simple fact is everybody in the military will tell you you can't defeat ISIS by just bombing. You've got to have troops on the ground. And this looks to me like a gesture. Immediately after um, the Prime Minister finished today saying there were about 70,000 fighters ready to move in, uh, and attack ISIS. The Americans were putting out that it's most likely only half that number. And let's not get confused here. The, the, the alternative to Assad is not a group of nice young Liberal Democrats all sitting around. <laughs> there are other quite fanatical um, groups and pretty horrendous in much of the, the things they've done as well. We've got to learn from the mistakes of Iraq and Afghanistan. I want to see ISIS defeated, not just because they're a threat to us, but what they do to the people under their control. But you've got to have a strategy. And simply going and doing a bit of bombing, we've got to get a big coalition. And it, I mean, it's good to see that Russia and Iran are being brought in after decades of being at logheads with America. But I think it needs to be wider than that, because it's not just in the Middle East. Half of northern Nigeria has got Islamist um, terror groups. Half of Mali uh, in Libya. All our interventions have discredited us. If it's just seen to be Britain and America and France, it will just be looking like, here's the West looking after its own interests. We need to get China and India and other countries on board so it's seen as the world standing up to something of pure evil. <laughs> Matthew Hancock. Well, it is, what is clear is that ISIL are a danger to this, this country and to Britain. And I don't think that the choice is whether or not to tackle ISIL, because they are already killing British citizens and they're already attacking Britain and attempting terrorist atrocities here. But you the share that with Ken Livingstone, who's just said yes, the same thing, in it, effect, except he wants it done in a different way. The real choice, David, the real choice is not whether or not to take on ISIL. The real choice is whether we take on ISIL now, in their heartlands in Syria, where they're plotting these attacks, or whether we wait and take them on on the streets of Britain later. And I think we must not wait. Okay. <laughs> Pete well, the simple truth is that there's no lack of nations in the air bombing Syria just now. There's something like 12 nations currently engaged in bombing that nation just now. And they're bombing from planes, they're bombing from drones, from warships. There's the, a the variety of different means which all this ordinance has been delivered. And I think the question that we've got to really look at, will we assist the situation in Syria by getting involved in all this? Now, we've already seen the incident uh, earlier this week, this desperate incident where a Russian jet was downed by, by a, a, Turk, a, a Turkish militia. So we're into a real difficult tension situation when it comes to all these sort of things. And to just to believe that a further round of bombing is going to actually resolve anything, I think is very, very naive. And I think it's something that we have to consider very, very carefully before we go down this course of So the, the SNP... 
the SNP will be voting against in any circumstance. Well, what we said, is we, we listened to the case and we listened very carefully and patiently to the Prime Minister today, but we've not heard anything that convinces us thus far that this would be a good course of action. I mean, like, what we're looking for is, is some sort of solution. And until we hear that there's a plan for reconstruction, that there's a means towards peace and reconciliation in that country, then I don't really believe that getting further involved into military action right. is actually going to make any real difference. The woman here on the right. <laughs> The backlash from Iraq was quite severe. What's to suggest that the backlash from Syria wouldn't be the same? So, Matt, Matt Ford, try that. I'll come back to you. Um, I, think that, I think Ken's right that we need to learn the lessons of Iraq. I think there's a real danger that we're deliberately learning the wrong lessons. There are some people that would like to question Britain's role in the world, and I think whatever the rights and wrongs of Iraq, and clearly the problem with Iraq was intelligence and a lack of post-war planning, things that even the people at the heart of that decision have now accepted were, were, were deeply at fault. My fear is that people actually say Iraq is an excuse for Britain not to stand up and to walk by on the other side of the road when people in Syria are being slaughtered, when people in Iraq are being slaughtered. I don't want to be part of a country and I wouldn't want to ever support a government that says that Britain actually, with all this power, with the strength of our democracy, with the tools that we have at our disposal, allows Syria to just burn while we sit here because the left is paralysed because of Iraq. And I think it's a major problem, predominantly for the Labour Party. And I think everyone has to think, yes, Iraq has caused deep scars on the political landscape, but don't use it as an excuse for Britain to retreat when we are a responsible global actor. Okay. Yes, you, sir. Yes, you, sir, up there. Yeah, I think the uh, seeds of this was sown in the 1990s, and now we're reaping the rewards. Because everybody from that time onwards... I've lived in a war zone uh, area. Syria, What's your view Iraq, about the bombing? Iran. Yeah. What's everything. your view about bombing? The bombing, I, I think we should be doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm with Ken on a, up to a point. What I'm saying is, boots on the ground, I'm also with that. But we've managed over about eight or nine uh, administrations to decimate our armed forces, mm. where we can hardly look after our own country. Right. Maybe we should start by weeding out the people in this country, detaining them, and let's get the weeds out before we take the head. All right. Uh, there are a number of hands up, but I'll come to you uh, after I've spoken, to, after we've heard from Kate Andrews. Kate. No, bombing is not going to make us safer, and that is because the Prime Minister is not actually committed to defeating ISIL. Arguing that we need to send airstrikes over and then in the same speech saying, but that won't be enough, but actually boots on the ground probably will be necessary, is not a long-term strategic plan to defeat ISIL. And it needs to be defeated. This is not Iraq. Saddam Hussein was not an immediate threat to British citizens. ISIL is. It's already killed over 30 British citizens. It's killed your neighbours. And they're killing and slaughtering their own people in masses and torturing them in awful ways. And if Britain is serious about defeating ISIL, then they will work with the countries that Ken suggested and countries all over the world uh, to form a long-term strategic plan. But the Prime Minister is not committed to that. And if he's not willing to commit to that, then we cannot send those bombs over there. That's what the United States did a few years back when Obama set that red line. We sent some bombs over. It destabilized the region further. And that helped ISIL grow. On this, the shadow of Iraq looms large over this, but I was actually against the Iraq war because I didn't think that it would help with tackling terrorism. But I'm in favour of action now because that terrorism is clearly coming from and organised in Syria. And yes, of course, the diplomatic solution um, and the... Uh, humanitarian solution are both absolutely vital and we've made some progress on those the v talks in Vienna are moving forward as Ken said there's more people from around the world involved and the UN Security Council has passed a resolution uh, saying that all necessary force is um, uh, is okay to use but this is different from Iraq because this is about directly tackling terrorist threats that we know can harm us here because they've tried seven times in Matt, the past year Matt, and they have just succeeded in Paris and we have to take that action. <laughs> got, I mean, 
If you look, here in Manchester and in London during the Second World War, you were bombed night after night by the Nazis. In London, some nights, 500 people were killed. My mum got up every morning and went to work in the munitions factory. It didn't break our will. If you're going to defeat this horrendous ISIL, you've got to have tens of thousands of troops on the ground. <laughs> look, look what happened with that awful mistake of the Americans bombing hospital. How many more fanatics did that recruit for ISIL? I mean, bombing is too indiscriminate. You need troops there finding the terrorists. So, so, British, British, troops, on, okay. British I, troops? As part of a broad coalition, yes, and with UN backing. So, what it, we it, can't so, be is America's poodle again. I'm sick and tired of oh, watching... Brit no, no, I'm sick and tired of watching British... I'm no. sorry, but I want Tony Blair do whatever George W. Bush wanted. Our Prime Minister should be defending our interests, and that means a broader coalition. If you can't get China and Nigeria and Iran and all those others on board, it will be seen as the West, all after the oil interests. So you again. want a huge... Well, sorry, yeah. this is it, Claire. You want a large army of a large number of countries... Backed on by the, the UN. And, it can't and, just be the West. And with the British Army there. Yeah. But we just saw last week the UN vote unanimously in the Security Council in favour of action. And this point about oil that we sometimes get from people on the left, mm. Syria is the 60th largest producer mm. of oil. It hardly has any relative to other places. And we're already you know, taking action in Iraq to tackle terrorism. But we can't. We, we have to stop at this border. The ISIL themselves don't... No, but he's saying that. he would, would have boots on the ground, which the Prime Minister doesn't want. Well, I think that... British boots, boots on I the ground. Prime Minister will do boots on the ground. Yeah. I think boots on the ground from, uh, in a combat role from Western countries like ours would actually complicate what is a pro at difficult the end of the day, situation. And, do it? But, there, but there are yeah. troops there that are ready there's, there's to do it. There's a quarter of a million people being killed in Syria. 11 million people are homeless. It's the biggest refugee crisis mm. that we've seen in modern time. Do we really believe that by a bombing mission is going to improve the situation for ordi mm. ordinary Syrians? Uh, <laughs> and this is the questions that we've got to ask ourselves. So what, what would considerably make the situation in Syria better? Now, being the 13th nation engaged in the bombing camp, I suggest this isn't going to make that situation any right. better. And we need a diplomatic solution. The end has been mentioned. That's the way to do it. Bring peace, bring stability. Let's get this thing resolved through diplomatic means. All right, I'm going, to come, yeah. hang on a second. I'm going to come to members of the audience. I just want to clarify one thing. Are you going to get the votes, do you think? Well, in the House of Commons well, to go I, for I think it? There was, I think there was progress made today in the House of Commons. There's How many an... Labour voters no, no, are going I, to support I, you, yeah, we, we, are, we are talking to Labour MPs. We're giving them the security briefing. So is their leader. And, and the question is, is the House of Commons going to support it? And that was the question I asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, like you, nobody knows until we have the vote, but we're not going to have the vote until we are confident that there's enough. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable. Ken Livingston, what's going to happen in the Labour Party? Because tonight we hear there are a lot, the majority of the shadow cabinet are going to vote yes to bombing and the leader of the Labour Party is saying no, and they're and going I, to meet and talk about it. What's, what, in well, your view, is, is, is going to happen, or is Labour going to fall apart? I, think, I, I don't think Labour's going to fall apart. We've got to decide whether we have a, a line or whether we're going to allow a free uh, vote. But the simple fact is that, although the Shadow Cabinet um, has quite a strong support um, for, for bombing, I suspect the Parliamentary Labour Party is much more divided on that. And over this weekend... MPs are going to go back to their constituents, they'll be listening to what people say, and I think that I, they'll find there's a lot less support out there amongst the public for simply bombing um, than there might be in Parliament. Mm. I mean, there'll be a shadow cabinet meeting, I think, on Monday to decide mm. what to do, and until then, I mean, I can't predict the future. If... But if I was there, I'd say bombing on its own isn't enough, we shouldn't get caught up in that again. I remember yeah. when Tony Blair was told by the security services, if you go into uh, Iraq, we will be a target for terrorism. And he ignored that advice, and it killed 52 Londoners. We need Ken, to be absolutely that, clear. Uh, we, I want to see on the ground the capacity to defend ourselves. And right. in London, I don't know what it's like up here, we've seen thousands of police taken off the streets. And that's crucial in right. actually finding come, out who's at risk right. and who's Just come back for a moment yeah. to politics. If, if these... If the senior members of the Shadow Cabinet, mm. who have let it be known today that they're in favour of bombing, mm. um, are against the line that's taken on Monday mm. or the line pursued by the leader of the Labour Party, mm. you have a clear conflict. Yeah. What should they do? Resign? No, no. We can't on. carry on. This one isn't way or the, the other. Tony Blair era where well, everyone has to follow a line. The good thing about Jeremy Corbyn. Can, can do what they like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy is Corbyn allowing an open debate. 
and he accepts the fact that people have different views. I mean, we, we didn't benefit from all those dec uh, that decade of Tony Blair. Everyone had to be in line on everything. You can't force people to vote to kill other people or not to vote to kill them. This must be a matter in which people have the freedom to actually express their own uh, views. So it will be a free vote. I suspect it will be. I, right. I can't promise, I expect it will be. You'll you predict a free vote. There are two major things here that need to be challenged. One is that party unity is some sort of problem. Uh, the public expect major political parties to be unified and to get behind their leader, and actually they expect a leader to lead. Mm. Uh, the left seems to be the only group of people that have a problem with people having charisma or any sense of direction when they're in a leadership role. And secondly, this idea that you can absolve the people that killed those innocent Londoners by blaming it on Tony Blair is shameful. Well, you can, because... Blame it on the people who carried out the atrocity. Yes, and go, go and look what they put on their website. They did those killings because so just, of our invasion of well, Iraq. Well, then just accept the propaganda of the terrorists then, Ken. No, no, they, were, they gave their lives. They said what they believed. They took Londoners' lives in protest against they our invasion of Iraq. They used a line that they knew we, would divide. Excuse me, we were lied to by Tony Blair about Iraq. Oh, there right. were no okay. weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> we don't defend the lie. I'm, I'm not defending this. intelligence. Yeah, it's, 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 really right. right. it's really important. It's very important to be clear. The lies of Tony Blair, whatever they may be, will never, ever absolve the terrorists for no. their actions. And they are. We, but, but you have just, you have just brought those two things no, together and suggested that they blend okay. together. If we hadn't invaded Iraq, those four men would not have gone out and killed 52 Londoners. I we think, know that. I think you are accepting their excuses. I'm sorry, I the saw there are the problem. I saw right. the police think, intelligence. Think, right. All, all right, hold on, everybody. The problem, no, with, hold the on, problem with the argument that Ken is making is that he is letting ISIL off the hook. No. These are grown men who are going out onto the streets, who are killing You're letting innocent people, by getting and the we should numbers. not give them excuses. All right, come, I want to come back to the question that was originally asked by Monique, whether bombing ISIS really makes us any safer. I go to some members of the audience. The <coughs> woman up there on the... On, yes, you on the back there. Uh, can I just say that when you first started this, uh, your you opening statement in this, I think it was completely irresponsible and fear-mongering the way that you spoke about ISIL. ISIL are currently operating on the idea that fear is what will perpetuate mm. their power. And when you come on television mm. in front of millions, all you do is you, re, you reinvest that fear. We know Paris was bad. We know, we know people are upset about it. Of course, it's an emotive subject. But in, in coming on telly and, and speaking like that, I think it's completely irresponsible. What, what do you think he he should have said? I feel like he should have just answered the question as opposed to saying this stuff about, oh, we either fight it now or we fight it in the future. It's ridiculous. Answer the questions that are being given to you because the fear mongering is not getting us anywhere. Oh, I mean, uh, uh, the man, uh, the man in the front here in the pink shirt, you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, I find myself in a, in a really strange position where I, I'm actually finding myself agreeing with Ken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we, we have to realise that this is never going to be sorted around a table. ISIL are not willing to negotiate with mm. anybody. Yeah. They're not, it's just not going to happen. So you want an army like Ken does to go into Syria? I, 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 unfortunately, I think it's the only solution. All right. Um, it's not what I would choose, but I think it's the only solution. OK. And uh, you, sir, here in the front row. Considering what's happening to the minority groups like the Christians and the Yazidis there, which can only be described as genocide, how does bombing help them get out of these situations? Should we not send a force yeah. to free them and bring them over and help them rebuild their lives? So the, 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 your view is that the bombing is in, inadequate, in effect, yeah, it's, that it, it won't it, achieve It's indiscriminate. Anything. It doesn't differentiate between who we're trying to save and who we're trying to Come kill. Come back to that point, well, if you would, Matthew. The, precisely the reason that the UK can add, uh, can improve on the campaign that's already happening. Why should we get involved? Not only because uh, there are uh, terrorist threats against us that we can directly respond to, but also because some of the equipment that we have is more targeted than anybody else has around the world, so we can have a more targeted uh, campaign. And crucially, there are boots on the ground. There are Kurdish boots. There is the, uh, the Free Syrian Ar Army. 
And they can't do it without air support, and we can provide that air support. But what is Britain support. going to do when the bombings start? We, exactly. If we, send, no, if we <clears throat> send those bombs in there, then we are partially responsible for whatever happens to the region. That happened in Afghanistan, that happened in Iraq, and we were, no one was fully committed to what it was going to take. If, it, that, if that further destabilizes Syria, are, is the PM and are you going to be committed to going in and doing what's necessary to help those people? This is precisely... This is precisely why we need the overall strategy that's been set out, including the diplomatic solution, including the process in Vienna, and including today the billion pounds that we've set aside for humanitarian relief and helping Syrian people get home afterwards. The Prime and Minister has set out a short-term strategy. There is no long-term strategy yet. Once that's there, I think most people around this panel mm. are it's actually pretty on So board. what do you say to the Prime Minister's argument, which was that if our allies are there doing this and the French are there and want us there, we should for that reason do it because allies should if stick I, together. If our allies want us there, then the allies will sit down at the table and come up with that long-term strategy. Mm. I don't think Britain should rely on their word that they are just going to, we should all be there together and then we should all retract together. No, they have to sit down, they have the, to work it the, out. The woman at the very, very back there. Yes, you. Um, I just wanted to come back before Matt said about um, the strength of our democracy and that being um, something great about the UK. And I just think it's sad that actually there's been very little discussion about any kind of political strategy or anything wider than actually just bombing um, a nation. And, and I just think that's really sad. I, don't, I actually don't think, in terms of what the solution is, obviously it would be difficult to get there. I think most people have the view that we should have boots on the ground. In my view, Britain should play a role in that because I think we are, on the whole, a responsible global actor. I don't accept, actually, that all the wars Britain has been engaged in have been uh, disasters. Sierra Leone was a positive intervention, as was Kosovo, and I think most people would accept that. I think you need to clearly defeat ISIS and then move to a position where you get rid of Assad. And actually, in terms of how much the public are prepared to stomach, and this is incumbent on all of us in this room, uh, and wider, that aren't politicians, once Britain, <coughs> if it does, gets involved in this conflict, to put immediate pressure to bring troops home is the worst possible pressure we should be prepared to say to those countries, if we go in, we were, we're prepared to stay for a generation or longer. We need to completely rethink about how we rebuild these nations in the future. All right. Um, yeah. let, me, let, let me just take briefly a question from Mr. Chadwick, please, following up on this. Stephen. Could the shooting of the Russian jet lead to World War III? And this is something that a number of people have raised in the backs of people's minds. Um, Who would like to go on that? Yes, it was, a, it was a worrying escalation when we saw that, um, and I think everybody was were very distressed at the images that we did see when that, when that actually happened. And you know, this this goes back to the tension that exists between what are supposed to be nominal allies when it comes to this, and the congested airs that we have over Syria with all these nations engaged in these bombing campaigns. And I think that um, the way that this has been escalated, and the United Nations getting involved in trying to cool cool some of these tempers and making sure that some of the heat's taken out, this is was a really appropriate intervention today. But I think this is supposed to demonstrate just how how like intemperate this could be and how dangerous we could be when it gets into these sort of situations where we face these real tensions being played out amongst what are nominal allies. All right. I think it's completely unacceptable for Turkey to shoot down a plane which wasn't targeting Turkey. And if you look, Turkey's largely sitting on its hands here because it doesn't like the fact that Iran's in there, um, in, in Syria, they got troops on the ground. Just like the Saudis. But the question was whether hands. this could escalate it, to a world war. It won't escalate to world war because there'll be huge pressure now on the Turkish government to stop doing such stupid All right. things. Anybody else it? want to go on this, Matthew? Well, uh, you agree with Ken? <laughs> <laughs> it won't be your career. I, I, I haven't. I haven't actually done that very often in my life. But the. Um, <laughs> but no, it's it, it's clearly a very complex uh, situation. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact uh, that there are atrocities that we can help to stop uh, by taking action in, uh, with British airplanes. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that we, can, that we can manage the relationship with Russia uh, in doing that. OK, I'll take a couple more... Sorry, I'll take a couple more points. The woman there, and then uh, y you up there. Yes. I'm um, just drawing the two points together. 
this focus on airstrikes and us getting into World War Three because we're all conflicting with each other, would it not be easier to look at the widespread of ISIS and tackling it in the countries and then going in together rather than all deciding we're all going to do these separate airstrikes and we're all going to strike each other down? Shouldn't we be looking at people who maybe are... Um, members of ISIS that aren't in Syria, because bombing Syria isn't going to stop those people uprising when that country goes down. OK. And, and you're saying that. It, it seems to me that this is not a, a World War III, it's more like a new Cold War. There is a fundamental difference between the Western ideals and the ideals of some of these uh, Islamist terrorists. And the only way we're going to do that is through strong leadership of countries like America, where they seem to have the weakest president they've ever had, Countries like Britain, where we don't have a Prime Minister that's looking for it, and we've got the clowns leading the Labour Party. And, and the only country that seems to be taking any role is Russia. And for some reason, nobody else is doing that, and that Russia is dictating the terms. OK. Take very briefly, and then we'll move on. You were just about to make a point. I, don't know I think this talk of World War III speaks to the young woman's points up there about how that is, that is real fear-mongering. I think we disagree about the previous point. I think that talking about the horrors of ISIL and the immediate threat to Britain is very important to be honest about, but speaking about World War III is incredibly dramatic. Nobody thinks that's going to happen. Everybody still thinks that coming to the negotiating table is a possibility. Um, and T Turkey absolutely acted mm. too quickly. They, they acted in, in a Russian haste. But that goes to show how scared people are. Um, and so we do need to be walking this very fine line of not fear-mongering, but talking truly about what's going on out there, because things are escalating, but yeah. not to World War III. Okay. And that's why okay. strong British leadership is, is so important, and I agree with you. If you retract from the global stage, the idea that everything just carries on and everything's peaceful is nonsense. You leave the global stage, people like Vladimir Putin, whose priority until recently in Syria hasn't been to try and remove ISIL, but to try and reinforce Assad based on an outdated patriotism of Mother Russia. It's berserk. This is why the strong democracy in the world have to be both. OK, and, and you, sir. Yes, this all this uh, silly talk of uh, bombs and military action, I was particularly surprised at that, that fellow there talking about bombing and military action. When actually, Which fellow what we were need you pointing to. At? Uh, that chap there, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Livingston. <laughs> but what really surprises me is the real issue is looking after this nation mm. here. Not looking after it over there, it's safeguarding this nation here. The terrorist that struck in France. We're living in France, legitimately. So they're living here, within us. Never mind wasting millions and millions of pounds trying to bomb somebody that you're never going to kill anyway and risk thousands of British lives. Pull the drawbridge up at Calais and look after the British people. OK. <laughs> um, 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 we're going to move on, because we've had half the programme discussing that, and I know we'll come back to it. Before we go to the next question... Uh, just so you know, we're going to be in Birmingham next week and in Bath the week after that. The details of how to come to question time, you'll be extremely welcome to come, are there on the screen. Let's take this question, please, from Sally Wheatman. Sally Wheatman. Does the Chancellor's U-turn on tax credits mark the end of austerity, does the panel think? The Chancellor's U-turn on tax credits <coughs> yesterday, does this mean that all that business about austerity it was unnecessary because he's now giving it all back to us. Uh, Kate Andrews. Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, most people define austerity as closing the deficit, and he is going to continue to do that. The Chancellor has really lucked out. He's found an extra $27 billion in the budget between bringing in more taxes and having uh, lower uh, interest on the debt, that he's been able to find this money. He's been able to stick to his deficit projections. Well, okay. He's five years too late. But in this new parliament, he's managed to stick to his deficit projections, uh, as well as cut back on all of the spending cuts he's going to make. Um, I'm very pleased to see that he has made this U-turn on tax credits. If you are going to have a welfare system, the last benefit that you want to cut is one that incentivizes work and gets people working mm. and brings money into their own pockets. Um, do you, do you, and I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased to see he's U-turned on that. But do you, do you believe that what we thought was true in July is not true in November suddenly, and he's suddenly got oodles of money that he didn't mm -hmm. have in July, and now in November he's got it, and, oh dear, police can yeah. have it after all, and we won't 
Oh, well, I, I, I'm not or fully think... convinced. The, the Office of Budget Responsibility has found this extra money. I don't think they're lying. They tend to be pretty honest. Um, but what he is doing is he's gambling. He's assuming that he's going to continue to get more tax revenue in, and he's assuming that this interest is going to remain low. So it could all be reversed, and he has time. It's probably not. If things going... go wrong. I mean, the growth projections suggest that it's not going to be fully reversed in a year's time. But if things do go sour, say there were another crash, say it's just you know something we can't even imagine were to come to fruition, we would be looking at another budget. And that's a really interesting point and an important point is that one of the big problems with this chancellor is that he continues to do a budget by budget, mm -hmm. uh, year to year analysis of where Britain's at. And he also won't plan for the long term. This seems to be a, a very common theme this evening, but there's no planning for the long term. How do you plan, how do you plan for the long term? Uh, well, you, you put real investment where it matters. You put money back into people's pockets. You ensure that growth continues to go up. I would have preferred to see the extra money that he got go to taking the low paid out of tax, go to removing that national insurance that the low paid still put into the system. Um, and, and I think that would have been better for the country. He hasn't done that. He's committed to more and more spending, and I think a lot of it's arbitrary. Okay, somebody's saying mm on my left, and I don't know which of the mats it is. It's not Matt. You don't think Matt Hancock is agree with that? No, I don't think he was. Yeah, um, it's probably you. The two things there. Firstly, George Osborne didn't U turn out of ideology. U turned because the Lords humiliated him. Uh, first and foremost. That's not fair. That's the, not second, fair. the second thing here is that at a time when the Labour Party is drifting to the left, David Cameron made that wonderful speech in the summer claiming that they were going to occupy the centre ground. The intention behind that tax credit change fundamentally challenges the view that the Tories are the party of the centre ground to attack. Fundamentally, working class Tories, a lot of them, who believe that work should pay more than benefits, shows that at the heart of George Osborne, despite being a, a fairly canny political operator, actually are deep, deep problems with his analysis and deep, deep problems with the sort of country he's trying to create. OK. Um, can I, can I... Hang on a second. No. Matt, Matt, Matt Hancock, if, if, he, if he really meant what he says about reducing the deficit as soon as possible and fixing the roof and all that, uh, and he suddenly offered this money that they say is now available because of uh, interest rates being yeah. low and all the rest of it, more tax coming in. Yeah. Surely the sensible thing for the Chancellor to have done would have been not to reverse his decision, as he was saying, uh, but actually to put the money in the kitty and say, well, we've now paid off some of our national debt. Well, he did that with part of it. No, but, 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 but he well, completely did. reversed the office. He says on the basis of the House of Lords and the clear political embarrassment you were, you were suffering. But if he was true to the beliefs that he'd set out, wouldn't he have said, well, there we are. Well, I think that when you... have now got some more money. I'm, when not you gonna, I'm not going to give it to, to you people. <laughs> I'm going to give it to the against the debt. So when you get some more money, I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, whether as a nation or you individually, David, get £27 billion. Pounds. Um, it's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> it's perfectly I don't know about that. I'm not sure what I do with that. <laughs> well, the BBC pays well. The, uh, it's perfectly reasonable that you put some of it towards paying down debts, invest some of it in infrastructure in the long term, and he did some of that, as uh, Kate was calling for, and use some of it to um, ameliorate some of the more difficult decisions. But the end point is still the same. You know, we said in the manifesto that we'd save 12 billion off welfare. It's important that welfare is fair to the people who pay for it as well as the people who need it. We said that we would have a country that lives within its means, protect the economic security of working people, and crucially, tackle the deficit and get rid of it. So, because I just don't think it is fair to leave to our children and our children's children more debts than they could possibly afford to pay off. All right. Well, I don't often agree with the Adam Smith Institute, but I do think the problem, <laughs> not just of this Chancellor, time. but Labour Chancellors, it's just get this budget through, we have a nice budget before the election, then when the election's out of the way, we claw it all back. The tragedy is, for 35 years, we haven't had a long-term strategy. We should have invested in modernising our manufacturing, like Germany did. We see <laughs> six million jobs lost, and this is the thing. We're currently running the biggest balance of payments deficit in our history. And why? Because half our exports from manufacturing, which is now just a tenth of our um, economy. And when I see Cameron say, oh, we must export more to China, great. 
Germany exports five times as much as we do to China because they didn't allow their mm. banks to run their economy. They mm. continue to invest in their manufacturing. They've probably been issued with more little red books than, than, <laughs> than, than, than the Conservative Party. Well, yeah, I, Conservative I, Party only got one I little red book. I have to confess I never bothered to read Mao's little red book because I was never much of a Maoist myself. <laughs> so you wouldn't have quoted from it. The woman up there on the right. Can I just come back and say that I think it's got very, very little to um, making the deficit smaller. It's far more to me about dismantling the welfare state. Yeah. I've got... Um, well, go on. I have a son with a learning disability. He has no social worker, no care plan. His transport to and from school is threatened. His college place has just been withdrawn. I think the reality on the ground for people like us living everyday lives is that austerity is devastating. Mm. Certainly for my son and young people like him, we feel as though he's been written off by Cameron's government. And, and <laughs> Do, do, ye do yesterday's announcements make any difference to you? Sorry? Do yesterday's announcements make any well, difference to you? Well, no, they don't, you? because they're still, they're, they're still planning £12 billion in welfare cuts. They make no difference at all. I mean, our children are amongst the most vulnerable uh, children in the country, I would suggest, yet Trafford Council's decided that they can make their own way to and from school. And the reality of these cuts coming down from central government to local government are absolutely devastating. I'm not sure Westminster realises that. Okay. Pete, I'll come, I'll come to you. But do you want to just answer her, answer her point? Answer her answer. Well, of course, you know, if we don't have a country that can live within its means, then we can't... But well, you are not reducing the deficit, If you don't want a country that lives... You've just if you just accepted if that. You, if you don't want... It is not flannel yeah. to want to deal with the deficit. Hold on. If we don't have a country that can live within its means, then we can't fund those sorts of public services that people like you rely well, on. Well, so we pay and, our taxes, and it is... but our children can't go to school. Is that what you're suggesting? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Let Matthew Hancock just yes. finish his point. Just li listen to him. And Firstly, then, you know. yesterday we increased the education budget, so of course it's important that people can go to school and there are more good school places uh, than before we came to office. But and crucially, you mentioned the care plan. I agree, that's an important policy. It's a new policy that was brought in with, when I was in the education department. Um, and the, but the central point is this. You can't have a strong economy if you don't take decisions that make sure that we can deal with our debts and get them down and instead you know, leave them and our generation not take the decisions but that I are necessary to, right. deal, to deal with these debts. But I think right. you're no, deliberately no, 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 missing the point set. about the yeah. school. Pete, Pete Bush, I, 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 I'd agree very much with the lady at the back. And what we've got to remember here is that austerity is a policy choice. And this is a Conservative government who are deeply ideologically committed to an austerity programme. I mean, we're, we're all delighted. The tax credits have been withdrawn, but they're all going to be clawed back again with what they're doing to universal credit and what they're doing to house and benefit. There will still be £12 billion of welfare cuts down the line. Now, yesterday's statement wasn't so much smoke and mirrors and conjuring tricks. It was a meeting of the whole magic circle, <laughs> such was the things that was being done on the back of all of this. And we've still got to pay for this. And this is a government who will de be determined to drive through their austerity agenda, and they do not care less who is hurt on the way as long as they are able to achieve their objectives. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, think, I think most people in, in the public, I, I think that the general public in general, find themselves somewhere in the middle with this. We know the deficit has to be tackled. We know that if it isn't paid down, then mo more of our taxes don't go on frontline services, they go on service and the debt. I think most people accept, actually, the deficit needs to come down. But it's about where you cut and it's about when you cut mm. and who you tax and when you tax. Mm. And it was a, it, just such an awful mistake. So we all agree we have to live within our means, and you talk very nobly about uh, burdening a country with debt, but you will burden poor people with debt. They will have to take out themselves in order to pay their bills. All right. I, I, we, heard from, we heard from the lady up there about it. I would like to hear from anybody who supports what uh, Matthew Hancock was saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's not there. a joke. Uh, yes, you there at the back. Well, 
it seems to me that somebody saying that they can't turn their children to school because of austerity, it seems to me your, none of your grandchildren will be able to go to school if we don't have austerity. Because the amount of interest we're paying on the debt now is nearly as high as what we're paying on the military. In 10, 20 years' time, it nearly might be as high as what we're paying on the NHS. It will become a larger and larger proportion of our uh, uh, expenditure each year. And if we don't tackle that now, we will, uh, we, we, we well, will always have the consequences I mean, of that. You're absolutely right. We have to reduce our debt. But we're still the fifth richest nation in the world. And this week, while we're being told we can't afford this, we can't afford that, Cameron's telling us now those four nuclear submarines will cost £40 billion. Pounds. Yeah. Well, it's a question of the choice. Yeah. I'd rather our kids had a better education. We have more <laughs> hospital beds than four yeah. nuclear yeah. submarines. Okay. This is why austerity is a policy yeah. choice and decision. Uh, uh, no, I want all of that. You, you can't I want schools, hospitals, and a nuclear deterrent. <laughs> yeah. I want all three. And well, maybe that's why we ran up so many debts under Labour. Well, but part of the I wasn't going to think. But Trident, uh, in terms of, in, no, but in terms of the, in terms of the economics, in terms of the economics of, of but this is a problem. The reason why Britain is a rich country, part of the reason why Britain is a rich country, part of the reason why people come here to set their businesses up, including a lot of people in the financial uh, industry, that actually contributed huge amounts to public spending uh, from the period 97 to 2007 on the backs of bankers, actually. Part of the reason people are prepared to invest global businesses here is because on the whole we are a secure society. And one of the things that keeps us secure and makes us a safe place for business, in the end, actually, is having a strong military and a nuclear deterrent. To simply <laughs> take that money from one end and say you save it on nukes so you can spend it on hospitals isn't true. In the end, Britain will be poorer economically, not just in a security sense, without a nuclear deterrent. OK, yeah. quite right. Let's just, let, uh, we'll just build on, for a moment, just five minutes on this other one. Sarah Shaw, please, about... The, how far the budget will stretch. Sarah. Over here, sir. The NHS can't meet the demands and expectations of our population. The future lies with expensive drugs and technology and things it was never designed for. Mm -hmm. So is it inevitable that the NHS will become privatised? And, and you're a GP, aren't you? Uh, is your view that it, it is inevitable? Well, it seems that the conspiracy is that the pri it's privatisation by the back door, that increasingly more services are becoming privatised. Certainly where I work in Blackpool, that there's outsourcing to private companies from our CCG locally. Mm -hmm. And it just seems that the system we have, the infrastructure we have, can't cope with the demands of, of the population. But do you approve of the idea that it becomes partly whatever privatised may mean to you or to... The government or whoever, do you, do you approve of the idea of finding a different way of funding the NHS? Yeah, I think it, I think it, it can't manage as it, as it is. It's just not, not feasible that it carries on in the way it's, it's going. Kate, Kate Andrews, I'll come to you. Um, coming into this country many years ago now, I discovered that Britain has this culture of providing health care to everyone free at the point of use. And let me tell you, coming in from a country that still doesn't, that was a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, I say that because now I'm going to say something a lot tougher, which is that while providing everybody with health care is absolutely crucial, the NHS is wildly out of date and it is not able to deal with those burdens anymore and it hasn't been for a long time. And what Britain has seen is a serious drop in the quality of health care that it's bringing to its people. It is substandard, not compared to America or Singapore, any of those radical systems, but compared to its neighbors. Look at Germany, look at Switzerland, look at France. Nobody would say that these are privatized systems. The NHS does not need to become privatized. The UK and the government can continue to pay for health care and ensure that everybody can afford health care. But what it needs to let go of is this idea that the government is the best system to be the provision of health care. Other countries like Germany and France and Switzerland have looked outside of those bureaucrats and said, actually, they might be good with the money, but somebody else is better at running my CAT scan. You think central government should pay for it? I but think, let somebody else spend the money. I think, What's the point I, th I think, well, there's a huge point. I think that there are a lot of different systems that we can look at. Some, the government just sends out a check to everybody, gives them a voucher to go out and purchase their own health care. In other systems, the government is more involved in actually paying the providers that give the health care. There are lots of different ways we can look at this. Right, the, important, the important thing is that everybody has access to that health care, but that they get to choose where they get it. And if you choose where you get it, you tend to get better service and quality. And the simple fact, though, is if we privatise, the health system, 
then the profit that the firm takes out will either come by increasing what we have to spend on it. America spends twice as much on health care as we Nobody do. Nobody said America. And I just rolled that no. out. And the reason we're not doing as well as Germany and France is we aren't spending as much as Germany and France. That's not and true. Yes, we are. I mean, both Japan, Germany and France spend a greater proportion of their GDP on their public health than we do. The UK spends less than Germany and France and Switzerland is true. By about 2% of GDP, we're not talking anything wild like America, which is 17%. We're looking at other countries more similar to the UK. 2% of their GDP. But regardless of that, the UK is the third least efficient in the OECD for spending its public health care money. You may spend less, but you're not well, spending that little amount of money very you're, well. You're, 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 are you agreeing with her or with him? Uh, yeah, I agree with Kate completely. I'm from Canada, which has a public-private cooperative in how we deal with our health care. We provide everyone with basic insurance, and then you can buy better insurance as you want. And everyone's happy with it, and it's far more efficient than my experience with the NHS here. But we tried this. I mean, Tony Blair's government got the private sector to provide the building of hospitals, and then we basically rent them. It's costing us four to six times more than if we bought them and done them ourselves. Because it's being done inefficiently. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, done by the private sector. No, it's well, being controlled exactly. by the government. It's, it's not Ma the Ma principle. Ford. It's not the principle of private involvement that's the problem. I think people need to remember what the NHS means. The principle of the NHS is free at the point of mm. use. Now, if the state gives that money to a private provider who can deliver that service better than the state, then in my view, that is positive privatisation mm. and is still actually a public service. And I think. Mm. Just as much as can you rail against private profit in public mm. services, which is an issue that I think a lot of us have, a lot of people even on the right, actually sometimes it can help drive up standards, also you have to be equally abhorred by public waste. That is taxpayers' mm. money, and as long as it sits there, not being used properly to keep our people healthy, it is a criminal waste of cash. But the weakness is it's run from Whitehall. What we should do is devolve our hospitals, the oversight of those to local authorities, people that know their area. I've watched every Labour and Tory health minister fail to get to grips with such a... Okay, okay. I rang the man there in the third row. The, the, you, sir, yes? Okay, thank you. What I think, I think NHS is fantastic, but ultimately it is true that it is facing a large amount of demand. And I think currently things like PFI are just ripping the NHS off. Mm. It's creating, you know, a massive financial burden. <laughs> Ultimately, what I would personally like to see is, in some ways, a low-cost NHS. Like, for example, if you go to a GP, why can you not pay, for example, £5? Small contributions, not large, massive costs on the individual. Because I think they're ultimately, you know, paying for your healthcare in small amounts is not a bad thing. But at the same time, I personally, as much as I would like to see it free at the point of view, I don't think it's entirely sustainable. M Matthew Hancock. Well, I care deeply that the NHS is free at the point of use to everybody according to need. And the reason I care deeply about that is because as a father, if my children have a problem, no matter what time of the day or night, I can take them to the NHS and, crucially, everybody else in the country can. And here, I agree with everything that Ken said these last two answers. <laughs> Firstly, that PFI has been a serious problem in many hospitals, but also that we can tackle some of these problems by getting people who are closer to the problems on the ground to solve them. And here we are in Manchester, and we've just evolved both health and, crucially, social care to Manchester so they can be run locally by a newly elected mayor and bring the two together so that we can make sure it is as efficient as possible, given the increased amount of money that we put in yesterday, £19 billion more, the biggest ever injection of cash into the NHS. Okay. Be, be, well, well, we're totally devolved when it comes to the administration of our NHS. Thank goodness that we are. Well, there is nowhere, there's no way on earth in Scotland we're completely, it's completely devolved. There's no way on earth that we'd ever go down any sort of privatisation route. And to have the suggestion and idea that... Private companies are working for the best interests and altruism. It's just complete nonsense. They're working to make sure there's a return to shareholders. And to have that injected into something like our National Health Service just sits so angularly with how we respond and feel about our very precious NHS. Now, it's really important that we get back to the basics and Nobody principles, which is to ensure that it is free a point of use, that it remains a service that we're immensely proud well, of. Are you, against, works... are you against particular services like scanning? that she was talking about being, well, being, being 
operated by a private company. Well, well, we have a difficulty with that, yes, because we believe that this should be run by the, the, the public sector. It's the public sector that should be... Even if they pay for it, they can't, sure it, and it can't be run more efficiently well, privately we'll, than by public we'll sector. Well, look at the example of Foundation Hospitals, which I think was worth raising, and the real difficulty and issue the last Labour government got into, into this. What we do and what we find when we invite the private sector in, we're left with these type of poisonous legacies, which means that these buildings are built and we continue to pay for them for year after year, decade after decade. And that's the legacy of private, private, private involved, investment into private health education. In Scotland, it's in, private involvement in the NHS has increased under the SNP in Scotland. It's, that's just absolutely utter nonsense. Of course it's not increased under um, uh, the SNP in Scotland. What we've done is invested into our, our health service. But there is private involvement. In, there's, there's private involvement in every NHS and any, any health service. And would you like world. to kick all the private investment out? But sometimes it's necessary, David. Sometimes would you like to kick it all out? Ah. We, would, we, <laughs> we, would, we want to have make sure that we've got a public publicly run operated health service. Now sometimes yeah, it is necessary but your, to take in, your ideology, to make sure that we... Your ideology leads to substandard results for patients. Uh, well, because you, because you, you, are so, you are so desperate to say that it has to be public. The private sector cannot be involved on principle. And then you look and you look at Germany and you see that 9,000 more people in Germany are surviving from cancer than as should be surviving in the UK. You see that stroke results in the UK are terrible. Diabetes is terrible compared to these other countries and that is because our system is not efficient enough. All right, so Sarah, Sarah, run by Sarah Shaw, do you, do you agree with what Kate's saying? Yeah, I do. It was just to come back on Matt's point, really, that yeah. he's talking about devolving powers to people that know the health service the best. Yeah. And we've got the health secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who hasn't been listening to junior doctors mm -hmm. and all the stuff willing the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know? okay. All right. Yeah. You want to reply to that? Well, there is... Look, <laughs> very junior briefly, on junior will. doctors, the key is this, that we're trying to move um, the NHS to one that works every day of the week just as well. I think the junior, hold on. Yeah. yeah, no, no. And because, you know, whether, whether it is on a Sunday or on a Thursday night, if you w go to an NHS hospital, you want to have the very best care that the well, NHS We know that. Why hasn't, he, why hasn't he been able to get a deal from the doctors? Well, why he's, he been, to go to he's, he's, been, he's been asking to sit around a table with the BMA for months now, and I'm really yeah. glad that right. finally yeah. they've done it today. All right, I'll, take, I'll take one more point. The woman with, in, with the red pullover on there, yes. Briefly, if you would, ma'am. Um, uh, in terms of saying the NHS uh, provides a substandard service, that's because it's not funded properly. There are lots of very, very compassionate people working in the NHS, and their hands are tied. Okay. I've been working in the NHS for a very long time, and we provide real compassion, real care yep. for people when we're allowed to. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we've got... We seem to have about four or five minutes left. Benjamin Morton, please. Benjamin Morton. What are the long-term consequences of a Conservative government without opposition? <laughs> what are the long-term consequences of a Conservative <laughs> government without opposition? <laughs> Matt Ford. Well, the consequences are an even longer-term Conservative <laughs> government. Uh, without any opposition, because the problem the Labour Party has now, and I um, joined the Labour Party when I was 15 and left the day after Jeremy Corbyn became leader, and it was... <laughs> well, I don't... I, I appreciate the, the, the support, but it, it was done with a heavy heart. I care about the Labour Party, and I care about centre-left values, and I care about making the world a more equal place. Um, but I just feel now that under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, I, mean, I was struggling under Ed Miliband, to be honest, under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, it doesn't feel like the home for sensible people who want the entire country to be represented. In Ken Livingston. Well, look, we've just had a Conservative government forced to do a huge U-turn on its attack on the welfare state. That is because Jeremy Corbyn is opposed to what they're doing. And frankly, I... I was campaigning all over the country in marginal seats at the election. All on the streets, people said to me, what did the last Labour government do to me? And people like you who think Tony Blair was the high point of human civilization have got to recognise <laughs> the reason Germany won there's an anger there. We didn't create good jobs for working class people. We didn't build homes that their kids can afford to rent. The rich, Ken. the rich got richer and richer and everybody else struggled. Ken, it's right, a damning vote. Just, just simply not true. 
For the first time in a very long time under Tony Blair's government, it was the only time in recent history where the gap between rich and poor narrowed. The, the incomes of the poorest people in society wealth through the minimum wage. These tax credits, Jeremy Corbyn apparently saved, despite the fact it was the Lords, were brought in by Tony Blair. Ken Livingston is now campaigning for a Blairite policy he apparently hated ten years ago. This is just absolutely preposterous. And the Labour Party, sadly, will not be in a position to answer the people on the, on the doorstep when they say, what did the last Labour government do for me? Because there won't be one for about 30 years. I mean, the thing is... Uh, hang on a second. Uh, uh, no, I can't come to it, but you, you must be enjoying this, eh? Well, I kind of don't want to intrude on the private <laughs> I mean, But there is a serious point. You know, lots of people see the current Labour leadership as a complete joke. But I don't. I see it as a deadly serious threat to the economic <laughs> security of Britain. Because, because actually, you know, I think it's much less likely that, that the British people will vote for them. But I also think that if the British people did, it would be such a catastrophe for our country and for everybody in it that it is incumbent on us to deliver. Well, that's what, that's what, that's what you all said about me when I ran for mayor. And you know, then four years later, Tony Blair said, please come back and be our candidate. I, I, I was going to be a disaster. I thought, I thought be, coming from the generation that mm. I do, that the big arguments about how you run a country to make sure it's prosperous and people have the chance to get on, I thought those arguments had been settled. And it turns out we've got to win the argument for freedom and free market enterprise and for people being able to get on and get up and back that aspiration. We've got to win those arguments all over again. What's about 23% of children being in poverty due to your... That number has that number's fallen over the last five years, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Should, we, should, we, should be re we should be really, really worried about all this. I've never seen the Labour Party descend into unmanageable shambles as quickly as it has done in the course of the past few weeks. And you think every week's the worst week until you get to the next one. And this is where we are with the Labour well, Party. Sorry, we should, what, we should what, be shambles, what shambles are you describing? Well, this, this, what, 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 started as a hostile accommodation with the Blairites is now an in-your-face defiance yeah. when it comes to challenging yeah. the leadership. It is absolutely incredible to observe what's going on in the House of Commons and you should be worried because a, a Conservative government, a callous Conservative government unencumbered by any sort of serious challenge will just up the whole Conservative agenda. They'll do it without any care or concern when they know that they're not going to be challenged by a Labour party. That so what do you suggest Labour should do? Well, Labour's got to get their act together, for goodness no, sake. but how do they, they do that? I mean, look, they all disagree the, with the, each the other, members, according the to The membership you. elected a leadership. Let them get on with it yeah. and get the Blairites off their back, for goodness well, sake. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit rich. I mean, I've, I've left the party now, uh, and I don't fully... I would describe myself as a moderate. And it is a little bit rich to be preached unity by people like Ken Livingstone, who, when he didn't get his way, by the way, left the Labour Party and stood against it and defeated it. Uh, and against people like Jeremy Corbyn, who rebelled against it 500 times. You can't preach it's unity when you're a rebel. Thing, look at those votes. <laughs> you look back now, Jeremy was right about those. About not invading Iraq, about not deregulating the banks. Those were... And I'll tell you this. But you're you sitting there saying, I'm, well, I'm not going to be in the Labour Party. Yeah. Al although I had disagreements with Tony Blair, I went out and I worked to get Tony Blair elected. Him in London, Ken. I went you stood out as and mayor I stood against as an independent I remember candidate. talking, you stood as mayor against Labour's candidate. Yeah, because for mayor. the Labour Party rigged the ballot. I got oh, 74,000 no, 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 no. You said you'd accept. I got 74,000 votes. You said Frank you'd Dobson accept. got 24,000. I remember it clearly. They declared him the winner. I remember it clearly. You said you would accept the will of the NEC, and when it didn't go your way, you took your you toys home very, and you stood against the Labour Party. very, very worried about this type of split within the yeah. Labour Party. Okay. Because all it does I'm not is in the leave, Matt Han <laughs> leave Matt Hancock and his Conservative governments unbothered by any real opposition, Kate, which will make them even worse. Kate, Kate Andrews. I agree with Peter that uh, an unchecked Conservative government, it, I don't think it's going to go mental anytime soon. I mean, the majority is small. It only takes a few radicals, either on the far right or the moderate side, to overthrow what the Conservative Party wants to do. But a Conservative Party that doesn't have a real opposition can become complacent. Any government can. Um, and the Labour Party at the moment looks kind of like a well-funded think tank. They're just debating <laughs> ideology. They're not talking about policy. We need an opposition worthy of... Of name. All right, brief point from you, sir, up there, the back. Um, I think you should be scared of the Labour Party just because they don't want to be led, they want to be listened to. The mm. people want to be listened to, they don't just want to be led. And you're not listening. Well, that's what leadership is. So, are you saying, are you saying Labour isn't, is listening, isn't listening? They are listening, yeah. They are listening, they so are it's listening. what you want. Yeah. 
All right, I get you right. And, and the person there, the woman there, and then I'm going to stop. Yes. Um, I think this is the first time we're actually seeing uh, genuine opposition from the Labour Party. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's offering a different narrative from anyone else that we've seen before, and I think that's why everyone's so scared and are getting on his back about it. Really. Uh, are you... All right. And, and just briefly, are you concerned that so many MPs in the House of Commons appear to be against his leadership? Yeah, for me it is a concern because I think yeah. he's, he's very different from what we've seen before and I think they should embrace that and, and go with him. But they were elected by the public. Him. They were elected by the public, not a narrow band of true believers. They are reflecting the country more effectively than he is. Yeah, but the uh, voting system is not proportional, so right. I don't think they do represent... How much point that? Our time's up, we have to stop, I'm afraid.